Today's episode is brought to you by Surfshark VPN, the ultimate in online protection. More on them in just a bit. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host Simon Wamsey, well, one of my writers, in this case Ilza. Thank you, Ilza, has written me The Crystal Skulls, the invented artifacts of the Aztecs. It's Crystal Skulls, I thought this was just like a uh, Indiana Jones thing, where it was Indiana Jones and Shia LaBeouf. LaBeouf? LaBeouf? Whatever that guy's name is, and it wasn't very good. And I remember enjoying Indiana Jones as a kid, and then seeing that and being like, it's a bit shit, isn't it? Are the original ones Did I misremember? And it's like, no, the, the consensus was that the new one wasn't very good with the crystal alien skulls and stuff. I didn't really like it. Anyway, let's just jump in. I vividly remember the year 2012. That year the world did not end. Oh yeah, wasn't there like Mayan calendar? Like it doesn't go beyond 2012. So it's like, that's when the world must end according to the Mayans. And it's like, well, I'm sure the calendar on like my computer or whatever was like, it'll go to like 2099 or whatever. And then we've got no one's using this at 2100. So why would it continue? It doesn't mean the world's gonna end. It's just, they didn't do the calendar beyond that point. Why are we all so dumb? I was lying in an inflatable pool, those smaller ones probably meant for kids, with cocktail in hands on December the 21st, 2012, waiting patiently for the world to end spectacularly. Would it be a global earthquake, or perhaps lots of small disasters around the world, all occurring within hours of each other, or would we simply cease to exist? The possibilities were endless, and all endlessly unlikely. However, I was sorely disappointed. December the 22nd, 2012 dawned, and... With it a bad hangover and a nasty sunburn. To any of our viewers wishing to travel to sunny South Africa, sunscreen is your best friend. Just make a note of that. I was like, yeah, what are you doing outside in December? And then I remember Ills is from South Africa. I'm like, oh, I'm recording this in March. Uh, not even March yet. No, it's still February. <laughs> uh, it's February the 27th. So it'll be uh, March to uh, 28. Is it a leap year? I don't even know. Look, it's going to be March this week. That's for sure. But uh, it's cold here. It's probably really nice in South Africa. My grandma lives in Johannesburg. She's probably enjoying the weather. I mean, she's probably not. She's super old. <laughs> she's probably just inside being like, it's bloody hot. But let's get back to the end of the world, or rather the distinct lack of it. For after 2012, the world just continued onwards. So, what went wrong? All right, depending on your point of view. How did we go from promised world-ending catastrophe to three more Star Wars movies? The blame belongs squarely on the craniums of 13 crystal skulls. Well, the blame for the world not ending, can't really blame them for Star Wars. We can try. Uh, isn't George, George Lucas is to blame for Star Wars? <laughs> that guy for according to mayan legends though to be honest i haven't actually managed to find this legend in the mayan mythologies the ancients were given 13 crystal skulls these skulls were then dispersed all over the globe to be reunited in the time of mankind's greatest need 12 of these skulls were about human sized and contained information about 12 planets inhabited by other human-like peoples the 13th was bigger acting like a center of consciousness and if the 12 skulls were placed in a circle with the 13th in the middle amazing truths and wisdoms would be revealed i'm trying to remember that indiana jones film it this it was like it's old now right it's it's at least 10 years old 20 years old not 20 i'd say let me guess it's 14 years old and now i'm gonna look it up so that would be 2009 jones crystal skull 2008 that's not bad that's not a bad guess and I think in that one, weren't the, weren't the crystal skulls like big alien heads or something? But in my mind, they're like the alien heads out of Alien vs. Predator. Or Alien, or whatever those movies were. You know, the big scary aliens. So I'm probably misremembering. Unless those movies are tied together somehow, which I doubt. So did someone finally reunite the 13 crystal skulls and in doing so save us from annihilation? Or is this just some elaborate 200 year old hoax? Let's follow in the footsteps of everyone's least favorite Indiana Jones movie and explore the mysteries of the crystal skull. I told you no one liked this. What does it get on IMDb? I had it open, so this will be very quick to look up. 78%! It was a bit rubbish though, wasn't it? What does the audience say? 53, that's more like it. I mean, it was just a romp. It was okay. I'd say 53 is about right. I'm surprised the critics liked it. Oh, hell no! <laughs> Even though we keep calling them crystal skulls, the skulls aren't actually made of crystal. The life-size skulls found in museums and a handful of private collections are mostly clear rock quartz. Oh, come on. <laughs> 
<laughs> I didn't even know. Is crystal like a specific chemical or like specific type of rock? I thought it was just like, you know, doesn't isn't diamond like a type of crystal? I thought crystal was like, I guess I'm wrong. I guess I got a small brain. The remaining hundreds, if not thousands, that you can find for sale on eBay could be quartz, glass, or even resin, depending on your forger of choice. Perfect human and animal skulls are also carved from practically any gemstone that can be carved. I'm quite fond of the rose quartz and tiger eye skulls. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got a collection of crystal skulls, huh? After doing my research for this script, the Google Goblin has decided that I'm now into crystal healing, so sadly the ads popping up on my Facebook feed have improved. Oh no, yeah. My Lately I've been getting advertised the F-35. I think I brought this up previously. You might be thinking, what's an F-35, Simon? You don't mean the fighter jet. Surely no one will be advertising to you a fighter jet. Nope. Boeing Lockheed or whoever makes the F-35. I'm just browsing BBC. I'm just reading the news. Just having a time. Just reading. And it's like... The best offense is a good de uh, the best defense is a good offense. The F-35. And I'm like, who do you think I am? <laughs> Aren't you supposed to be selling to like governments? According to Crystal Healers, different gemstones have the ability to manifest intentions and raise vibrations. I'm not sure what that actually means. It means nothing and it's all fake. Stop it. By carving various gemstones into skulls, you can amplify the existing powers of the stone, which is why so many of these skulls are used for healing. They're not used for healing. People think they're used for healing. Let's be careful with our language. Let's not give anyone any ideas. The vibrational energy, which is not, I mean, vibrating things have energy. That's physics. Vibrational energy in this sort of healing thing? No. Just no, please no. Emitted by the skulls is also similar to the electromagnetic waves of the human brain. Oh, I bet it is. This. <laughs> I bet that's exactly right. I bet that's what the science says. No ma'am. No ma'am. No ma'am. No ma'am. This leads to enhanced psychic abilities in people spending any amount of time around these skulls and makes them a popular tool for meditation. Seeing auras, visions, or hearing sounds like the chimes of bells is apparently not uncommon. It is uncommon. And anyone who finds it common is imagining sh Imagination. Of course, the big boys, or skulls, I suppose, in the skull business aren't all that accessible. They're held in museums, and while some are held in private collections, are taken on publicity tours to meet and heal people, this mostly happens in the US. So, what is a skull lover elsewhere in the world to do? Well, have no fear, crystal skulls can be programmed! Oh my, this the, the lore around crystals runs deep! People make it up all sorts of It's time to stop! Placing new skulls in the vicinity of one of the ancient skulls allows the new skull to absorb some of the ancient dude's knowledge and healing abilities. So you don't have to go to Max in Texas. Max's energy will come to... Oh, Max is in like the just the name Max. <laughs> It is one of the crystals is called Max. Oh, uh, Max's energy will come to you via one of many helpful online crystal skull shops. Oh, the grift, the grift. There is a shop. I'm not going to say where it is because I did. <laughs> it's somewhat close to where I live. It's a shop for witches. I was walking past it the other day and I was like, oh, I don't know that check word. What does that word mean to my wife? And she's like, I don't know what the English word is, but it's a shop where witch's stuff is for sale. She's And she's like, what's that called? And I'm like, I don't know, witch shop? <laughs> what's it called in Harry Potter? Where the Olivieria's or whatever? The watch, the, the watch shop, the wand shop? Um, no, it doesn't matter, but there's a witch's shop and they sell all sorts of witchy shit. Real story, I bought a, um, uh, what's it called? Like one of those big spheres, the big glass spheres which you can use to tell the future. I mean, obviously not. For my mother-in-law, me and my wife did, because that's what she wanted for her birthday. <laughs> oh, she believes in the crystal stuff. It's great. She, the, the, <laughs> I won't continue. It's a too, too personal story. This is delusional. Uh, let's just carry on. Besides, you're here for crystal skulls. I might need some crystal meth to get through this. But it's not just mumbo jumbo. There's some science involved. Oh, there is, is there, Ilza? Come on now. You see, quartz has piezoelectric properties, basically, as the ability to generate an electronic charge when subjected to mechanical stress. This is part of the reason why quartz is used to manufacture electronic devices, especially storage devices and computer chips. Believers claim that crystal skulls are essentially data storage devices storing knowledge from ancient civilizations like, you guessed it, Atlantis, or from beyond the stars. Um, okay, sure, but I mean, it's a, a complicated process to get that to store the information and stuff. You can't just dig a rock out of the ground and be like, it's as good as a computer. <laughs> 
because it's not. I'm sure you've picked up on a trend. Words like electromagnetic waves, piezoelectric properties, storage devices, and computer chips show up quite a lot in online skull literature. It's almost like someone is trying really hard to sound academic. I could write several more pages about the psychic abilities of the skulls, but I think we all get the idea. Them skulls are magical. But if the tales of Mayan myths aren't true, where did the stories of the skulls come from? Well, let's visit Lubatun in Belize, planet Earth, and find out. So look, if you're like me, you love to travel, you love to explore new places, but did you know that going online while abroad can be a risky business? That's where Surfshark VPN comes in. Look, with Surfshark VPN, you can mask what you do online. It keeps you safe and private by covering everything you do. It encrypts your data and it hides your location. And you can virtually travel the world with just the tap of a finger like accessing the biggest movie catalog on netflix from another country plus you can get amazing deals on websites like amazon and aliexpress even if they're blocked in your country or while you're traveling but surfshark vpn doesn't just keep you safe it also offers surfshark alerts to monitor your personal data there's also got surfshark antivirus to keep your devices virus free and also surfshark search helps you hide from search engines and avoid those personalized creepy ads with over 3,200 servers in 100 countries, GPS spoofing on Android, and one subscription for unlimited devices, Surfshark VPN has got you covered. Plus, they've got a strict no-logs policy, 100% RAM-only servers, and clean web that automatically blocks over 1 million known malicious websites. So, whether you're an avid cafe-goer, traveler, or wanderer, Surfshark VPN is your go-to for online privacy and security. And the best part, you can try it risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Get Surfshark VPN today at surfshark.deal slash DTU or click the link below and use the promo code DTU, like decoding the unknown, DTU, and you'll get 83% off and three extra months for free. Happy surfing, and now back to today's video. The Mitchell Hedges Skull. There are many crystal skulls, but, but the Mitchell Hedges Skull is the one most people picture when crystal skulls are mentioned. The Skull of Doom, or more recently, the Skull of Love. A skull needs to adapt to the times, after all, stands at about 17.4 centimeters. 8 6.8 .8 inches high and weighs around five kilograms that's 11 pounds it's carved from a single block of clear quartz with a detachable jaw like most skulls it has psychic powers it does a little bit of healing on the side but unlike other skulls its life story is well documented and filled with excitement and intrigue it all started in 1924 i i don't know like i'm wondering like ilsa says that and i'm like i'm not sure if she's being sarcastic or if she really be believes the skull has heal healing powers i like to think not it all started in 1924 when Frederick Mitchell Hedges and his companions arrived at the ancient Mayan site of Labatun, the place of the fallen stones in Belize. This site possibly got its name from earlier excavations done by Thomas Gann, whose preferred archaeological method was dynamite. Ah, archaeologists in the past. How are we going to open up this pyramid? Let's blow it open! Mitchell Hodges was an old school adventurer. He had money, or at least people with money backing his exploits, and he had a Sunday evening radio show to share his adventures with the world at large. Apparently, he was a reporter, but according to Mitchell Hodges him Hedges himself, he was oh so much more. He claims that while in South America, he had been captured by Pancho Villa, a Mexican revolutionary general, and he had worked as a spy for the British Secret Service, spying on none other than Trotsky himself. He had discovered lost tribes and lost cities all over South America, including Atlantis, of course. The fact that these tribes and cities were already documented before he found them was pure coincidence i'm sure i'm sure this guy's telling a great story about his life though back in the day i feel like people just embellish shit nowadays people it's you know you don't want to embellish it because someone would be like oh, actually i lit this up found it on google found this other guy he said he did do that we interviewed him and now you're embarrassed it's like you just don't make up just don't make up stories anymore don't embellish you can't get away with it in his book danger my ally <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Even the name is like Jesus. Published in 1954, Mitchell Hedges claimed the skull was at least 3,600 years old and was used by the High Priest of the Maya. Apparently, the High Priest could use the skull to will death onto anyone and death would inevitably follow. He stated that the skull had been described as the embodiment of evil and claimed that several people who have cynically laughed at it have died. Others have been stricken and have become seriously ill. What was the name of the skull again? Max? No, that was the made-up skull. Skull. Look, this skull, ha, I laugh at its face. <laughs> What's death gonna do? Follow me. I'm so scared. Oh no, death. <laughs> like one week from now, YouTuber Simon has died <laughs> in mysterious circumstances. Um, 
and it was the Russians. I fell off a balcony. <laughs> It wasn't the skull. It's not the magical skull. The magical death skull. So when you m laugh, make sure it's not done cynically. Oh no, it's gonna get me. He actually didn't- he didn't actually state where he found the skull, instead claiming that he had a reason not to reveal how the skull came into his possession. Apparently the 1955 edition of the book omitted this reference to the skull completely. Some speculate that Mitchell Hedges was a secret agent, and therefore couldn't divulge how and when he found the skull. Sounds like he just nicked it, doesn't it? Where'd you get the skull? Didn't I found it? Just found it in the jungle, just loose. Didn't nick it. Definitely didn't steal it from a tribe. Definitely didn't do that. That would be immoral and wrong, and definitely not something people did in the past. <coughs> British Museum. <laughs> it's a collection of other people's sh However, it's more likely that it was omitted since there were still a few people around who could contradict his claims, but we'll get to that little detail soon. After Mitchell Hedges' death, however, the story changed when his daughter, Anna Mitchell Hedges, claimed that she had been the one she had been the one to find the skull inside of a pyramid during their expedition to Belize in the 1920s. She found the skull after the expedition cleared away a heavy wall which had fallen on an altar. Since they didn't have the right equipment, they could only move around five to six stones a day. It took three months before they found the jaw, which was about 20 two meters away from the skull. In 1964, Anna signed a contract with Frank Dorland, a San Francisco art dealer, to promote the skull with the goal of eventually selling it for at least $50,000 or more. 1964, so what, half a mil today? Maybe? In messages between Anna and Frederick Dockstarder, then director of the Museum of the American Indian in New York City, Anna claimed that the skull was over 3,600 years old. After having some tests done, she stated that the skull, at this point referred to as the Mayan Skull of Divine Mystery, it's a good name, was at least 3,000 years old. Apparently, the British Museum told her so. However, there's no re record that the British Museum said anything of the kind. Anna claimed to have found the skull in 1928 and mentioned the skull's special powers. Among these were the evil eye and protection from heaven. Wait, I thought you could just use it to wish death on people. <laughs> the skull could defeat the evils of witchcraft, and she described it as a benevolent divine magic dealing with heaven and angelic forces. This seems to be a bit of a contradiction with the skull of doom used to will people to death, but perhaps the skull had a change of heart by this time. Everyone who had been on the expedition to Lubatun uh, when the skull was found had passed on, so there was no one to challenge any claims made by Anna Mitchell Hedges. Yeah, all that thing. Also in the past, you know, people could still like contradict it if you wrote a book. Just wait till they're all dead and then publish your book. Or let your daughter do it. In 1970, Frank Dorland had the skull examined by the Hewlett Packard lab in Santa Clara, California. Hewlett Packard is in the computers, like HP? <laughs> really? 1970? They've been around for a long time. Since HP made crystal oscillators, their laboratory was well equipped to test quartz. Apparently, the lab made a number of interesting finds. Firstly, the lab determined that the skull was carved from a single crystal of quartz, rather than the three separate pieces as originally thought. They also thought that the skull would have taken a very long time to make, possibly as much as 300 years. How? How could it possibly take so long? I feel like carving a crystal skull, it's either impossible or quick. You know, relatively quick, like a year, two years, maybe. 300 years? What, what, what is something that can take that long? Why would it take that long? Someone just working away, chip, chip, chip? Like, it takes... That makes no sense. This is a load of barnacles. The skull had been carved against the natural axis of the crystal, which Dorland claimed was unusual, as it could cause the piece to shatter through. I'm not sure how true this is. One of the researchers dramatically claimed, Damn thing shouldn't even be. I feel this is all just made up and adding to its law. HP apparently couldn't find any microscopic scratches or marks indicating modern metal instruments and came to the conclusion that the skull was indeed ancient and carved with ancient tools and technologies. It all sounds very impressive, but unfortunately, it appears that HP has no records of these tests being performed. So we just rely on a word, that's it. It's all just a bit too perfect, isn't it? Dorland was not just an art dealer, he was also an art restorer, and to me it seems like he had some suspicions about the skull himself. At one point he stated that the teeth showed clear signs of mechanical grinding. He had also worked with Crystal in the past and apparently once mentioned that he could probably finish a job like a Crystal Skull in two years with the necessary financing, though I couldn't find any other sources to verify this statement. That's not bad, right? What did I say? A couple of years to carve that Crystal Skull? It's like either done quickly or not at all. It's impossible or done quickly couple of years. Dorland admitted that it wasn't possible to prove without a doubt whether the skull was indeed ancient or whether it had been made in modern times. He later tried to backtrack a little by claiming that the grinding on the teeth and the jawbone was uh, probably happens when the ancient skull was cleaned or modified in more recent times. That's convenient, isn't it? 
this guy doesn't have a conflict. Of course, he's got a conflict of interest. He wants to sell it for like $50,000. At the end of the day, Dorland was trying to sell the skull for $50,000 exactly, and presenting the skull as an ancient artifact was probably the best way to do it. Yeah, he's got a massive conflict of interest. If he found out that it was made like last week in China, it's, you know, it's going to affect the value of the skull. It's no longer going to be worth the same price as a house. It's going to be worth like 50p. However, Anna and Dorland soon had a falling out. He had yet to find a buyer, and the tales put out there as part of his promotion became wilder and wilder. Dorland claimed that the skull emitted sounds and lights depending on the position of the planets. He had also stated that the skull was excellent for scrying. That it originated... What the hell's scrying? <laughs> Well, I'm going to look that up. I, it, it, there's no explanation. What is that word? Look up. Scrying. Foretell the future using a crystal ball or other reflective object. Crystal ball. That was what the word I was looking for. Th this is not like a commonly known word, Ilza. Scrying is what people do when they look into a crystal ball. Holy sh**. Now I know. I'm going to bring that up in everyday conversation. It's going to be very useful. And it was even possibly taken by the Knights Templar on their crusades. No, it wasn't. He claimed seeing images of ancient buildings when looking into the eye sockets. In one tale, Dorland insisted that he heard a jungle cat prowling around his house when oh, the skull was spending the night. However, the tall tales didn't concern Anna as much as the rumors that Dorland actually owned the skull. At this point, Dorland suggested a new approach. Instead of sell selling the skull, Anna would collaborate with Richard Garvin on a book about it. She would then make public appearances with the skull to drum up interest and boost sales. Not a bad plan, to be honest. In 1972 and 1973, the skull was exhibited in New York, which just made the whole story seem even more legitimate, and the crystal skull... Uh, title of a book was published finally in 1973. Anna Mitchell Hodge's career as Anna Mitchell Hedge's career as the caretaker of a mythical artifact was well underway and would continue until her death. What a solid grift! She's made a lifetime's career out of nothing, in my opinion. According to The Crystal Skull, the book, the skull was found in the Louboutin tomb, part of the ruins of an enormous Mayan citadel in 1927. Now, those of you paying attention to the dates probably noticed something by now. Apparently not me, Ilza. I was not paying enough attention. Apparently, Anna couldn't quite remember when she had originally found the skull. It was either in 1924, 1926, 1927, or 1928. However, in January 1927, her father was in Bournemouth, nowhere near any Mayan temples, and in 1928, he was involved in a much publicized libel trial against the Daily Express. So, after much confusion, and I'm guessing a fair bit of research to find a date that couldn't be contested too easily, Anna decided that she had discovered the skull on the 1st of January 1924, her 17th birthday. I feel like you'd remember it if it was on your birthday, so it's definitely not that day. It coincides with at least one of two definite trips that her father took to Louboutin in the company of Lady Richmond Brown. There doesn't seem to be any record of Anna accompanying them, but there also wasn't anyone around anymore to say that she wasn't there. I don't remember all of my birthdays, but if I had made a significant archaeological discovery on one of them, I probably would. Yeah, me too. It was like, oh yeah, you remember your 15th birthday? when you discover that ancient crystal skull. No, because <laughs> it didn't happen. Just like this didn't happen either. <laughs> I don't remember the date. Let's just say it was on my birthday. All right, Anna. All right. I mean, whatever, I guess. However, there is a bit of a problem with the story told by Mitchell Hedges and his daughter, for the skull made its first appearance in London in 1933, but it was not in the hands of Mitchell Hedges. Uh, the skull belonged to a man called Sidney Burney, a London art dealer. Bernie had taken the skull to the British Museum for study. An article written by G.M. Morant details the skull and even compares it to the Aztec crystal skull in the British Museum's collection. The one difference was the lower jaw of the Mitchell Hedges skull being detachable, while the Aztec is in one piece. According to Bernie, his skull had come from an unknown source in Mexico in early 1933. A young archaeologist, Adrian Digby, working at the British Museum at the time, suggested Bernie's skull appeared to be a composite copy. The proportions of the skull were probably copied from the original skull in the museum's collection, while the anatomical detail was likely copied from a skull owned by the original carver. In his mind, Bernie's skull, later the Mitchell Hedges skull, was possibly an attempted forgery of the skull in the British Museum. So, how did Bernie's skull end up in the hands of Mitchell Hedges? Well, from 1933 to 1943, Bernie was trying to find a buyer for the skull. The British Museum already had a skull and wasn't interested in adding another skull to its collection. Weird. It's the British Museum. They love all that sh**. Apparently, the, I mean, the British Museum's pretty huge. And while I do 
kind of, I, I do pretty much agree with the uh the the modern opinion that the british museum just has a bunch of stuff from like other countries which it probably shouldn't really have um it's very impressive it's very large and apparently most of the stuff that they have is is in storage in warehouses and stuff and they like rotate it in which is pretty crazy all i'm trying to say is i'm surprised they just didn't take this and shove it in a box somewhere finally on the 15th of october 1943 the skull was sold at auction at sotheby's in london to british journalist fa mitchell hedges for 400 pounds in december of 1943 mitchell hedges wrote a letter to his brother telling him about the purchase he stated that he bought the crystal skull from the sydney burney collection and that it was carved from transparent rock crystal life-size and that according to scientists the skull dated to pre-1800 b BCE. Where he got this date from, only he would know. These fictional scientists also claimed that the skull was a multi-generational project that was passed from father to son and probably took five generations to complete. I, how? What is the reasoning behind this? However, six years later, in a local newspaper article published in May 1949, Mitchell Hedges was telling the world that it found the skull in Belize, not a showroom in London, and he stuck to that story until he died in 1959, and the skull was inherited by his daughter, Anna. Of course, Anna had an excuse ready. She claimed that she had discovered the skull during her expedition. Her father then left the skull with Sidney Burney as collateral for money borrowed for another expedition to Louboutin. However, Burney's son put the skull to auction. The easiest way for her father to reclaim the skull was to buy it at the auction personally i'd have called the cops but that's just me it's like yeah how are we gonna get our property back that's ours um we're just gonna have to buy it or just go uh legally get it back not the, necessarily the police just the uh just to go to the courts be like he's, he's got my skull i want it back I can't sell it it's fine give it back Although I guess if he didn't pay them the money back, the collateral thing, then maybe it's theirs. Who knows? However, this doesn't explain why her father then wrote a letter to his brother stating that he had bought the skull from the Bernie collection. When asked if she had any evidence, Anna replied that all her father's papers and photographs were lost in Hatteras during a cyclone, and a trunk of his belongings was lost in Plymouth. How convenient. I mean, unfortunate. After Anna Mitchell Hedges passed away in April 2007, the skull passed to her widower, Bill Homan, who allowed Dr. Jane Walsh at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History to examine the skull in November 2007. Please tell me that we now have the modern technology to be like, uh, no. Can't they do the, the crystal date? Not crystal dating. Carbon dating. Uh, Dr. Walsh, an expert on the crystal skulls, finally had the opportunity to study the most famous of skulls. She took two sets of silicon molds and then studied the molds using a scanning electron microscope, which allowed her to study the tool marks without risking any damage to the skull itself. Lubatun was abandoned around 800 BC, so if the skull is indeed from Lubatun, it would have been carved using sharpened stone implements and abrasive sand. There's no archaeological evidence suggesting that pre-Columbian cultures used hard metal tools like iron or steel for cutting or drilling, nor is there any indication of any kind of wheeled or rotary technology. A sharpened stone being pushed against a hard material like quartz would leave a rough line, possibly with slight twisting. Bosch and her team compared the tool marks on a jadeite artifact discovered at an, at an excavation and the tool marks on a piece of jadeite cut with diamond-coated high-speed rotary cutting tools. Let me guess, they match the high-speed rotary cutting tools. <laughs> The tool marks on the Mitchell Hedges skull are similar to the marks on the jade eyepiece cut with modern tools. To the surprise of nobody. It, it would have been a huge surprise if it was like, no, it was made with ancient tools. I'd still be like, I'm so skeptical that I'd still be like, someone just used ancient tools to fake it. But they didn't. They used modern tools, which isn't surprising. The polished areas also show parallel lines with what Walsh describes as a skipping pattern, suggesting the use of a high-speed tool. Dr. Walsh came to the conclusion that the Mitchell Hedges skull was a modern creation, not an ancient pre-Columbian Aztec one, created with technology from the 20th century at the earliest. The British Museum skull, which we'll look at shortly, was on exhibit from 1898, and since the Mitchell Hedges skull only appeared in 1933, Walsh agrees with Digby that the Mitchell Hedges skull is most likely a copy of the skull in the British Museum. Forensic artist Gloria Nate used facial reconstruction techniques to create an image of what the person might actually look like. The final product appeared to be a female with European features, further proving that the Mitchell Hedges skull and probably the British Museum skull were created in Europe using an actual skull as a model. However, the actual creator of the skull is a mystery. Eugene Bourbon, a big name in the skull game, had been dead for some two decades by the time the skull appeared, so in this one instance, he might actually be innocent. The Smithsonian Skull 
1992, a mysterious package arrived at the National Museum of American History that forms part of the Smithsonian Institute from an anonymous donor. The package, it turns out, contained a crystal skull. The anonymous donor claims that they bought it in Mexico in 1960 and the skull was Aztec in origin. The donor also claimed that the skull had previously been owned by Porfirio Diaz, the Mexican president who served seven terms. The skull is carved from white quartz and is larger than life, weighing in at 14 kilograms, that's 31 pounds, and standing at 25 centimeters, 10 inches tall. Unlike the other known skulls, it's not a solid skull. The cranium is hollow. However, Dr. Walsh was not convinced. According to Dr. Walsh herself, the skull just didn't look right. It was too big. The proportions were off, and it just looked too polished. Intrigued by the skull, but doubtful about its supposed origins, he set about the task of determining authenticity, and this is where the whole myth started falling apart. Examination of the skull showed two basic types of tool mark. The first were fine, cur cur curvilinear parallel stri striations suggesting the use of abrasives with rotary wheels or pads the second type of tool mark were coarser single striations inside the cavity a small deposit of black and red material was found using x-ray powder diffraction a method used to identify crystalline substances she determined that the material was silicon carbide or carborudnium carborudnium Carbo oh my god, that word is hard to say. Look, some sort of material. Natural deposits of carborundum are incredibly rare. However, in the 19th century, it was synthesized and became a common abrasive used for lapidary work the carving of precious stones and semi-precious stones. All of this research led Walsh to believe that the skull was most likely made in Mexico shortly before it was sold, probably in the 1950s, to the anonymous donor as the technology used to polish the crystal only became available after World War II, thus not an ancient skull. Can you really waste museums' times like this? Just send them a crystal skull and be like, yeah, 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 Porfiri Ideas gave this to me. <laughs> and some, like, scientist goes off on, like, a hunt and, like, is wasting all these, like, lab resources and stuff, identifying and it's like, nah, mate, it's made in China. Sorry. <laughs> I, I guess. I guess you can. <laughs> Don't get any ideas. Don't be sending fake Chinese skulls to museums. The British Museum Crystal Skull. In 1898, the British Museum picked up a crystal skull from Tiffany's in New York City. The skull is also made from clear quartz and is closer to life size than some of the other skulls, measuring 15 centimeters, 6 inches, chin to top, and 12 centimeters, 5 inches from ear to ear. The museum believed that they were buying a genuine pre Columbian artifact. But this wasn't quite the case. It turns out that the original source of the skull had been one Eugene Bobin. You see, in 1881, Bobin had tried to sell the skull to a museum in Mexico, but the folks in charge of acquisitions weren't biting, so he sold it to George Sisson in New York instead. In 1887, the skull was part of an exhibition for the American Association for the Advancement of Science before being sold to Tiffany & Co. George F. Kunz, who facilitated the sale to the British Museum, wrote in a letter to the keeper of the Department of British and Medieval Antiquities and Ethnography for the British Museum. That's a lot, right? Oh my god, that's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. <laughs> literally same thing in which he claimed that the skull was bought from mexico by a spanish officer sometime before the french occupation of mexico the skull was then sold to an english collector and after the death of the collector ended up in the possession of bourbon who then sold it to george sisson in 1886. in the late 1990s and 2000s the skull was dusted off for more detailed studies and research has confirmed again that it was very similar to the mitchell hedges skull However, since many believe the Mitchell Hedges skull is a copy of this skull, that is not surprising. <laughs> we already discussed this. Ian Freestone, former head of the Museum Scientific Research, and his team made dental resin casts of the skull's surface and then studied them with a scanning electron microscope. Much like the Smithsonian skull, the team found marks that indicate some kind of rotary tool was used to carve the skull. Since this technique was only introduced in the Americas after the arrival of the Europeans, the skull is most definitely not pre-Columbian. In fact, it's quite clearly post-Columbian. In 2007, microscopic analysis showed tiny green crystals that turned out to be iron-rich chlorites, indicating only three possible places of origin of the quartz. Brazil, Madagascar, or the European Alps, nowhere near Aztec country. Freestone concluded that the skull was most likely made from a Brazilian crystal, and the cutting and polishing probably occurred in 19th century Europe and possibly Germany, as the rotating wheel was a common tool used in jewelry houses at the time. So, I mean, they are making these from, like, crystals, which is cool, because I kind of thought, like, a skull-sized crystal? That's a massive crystal that you've got to start with. Which is kind of cool that just giant crystals like this exist. I always thought crystals were kind of small. And I assumed these were like, not like made from resin or whatever, but from like glass or something like that, you know? Like, or like some, they, they were artificially grown crystals. 
something like that. It's cool. That, I mean, it's, well, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I, why am I so surprised that there are giant crystals? I'm sure there are giant crystals. For those who want to see it, the skull is still on display in the British Museum. However, instead of being considered a Mesoamerican artifact, it's identified as probably European, late 19th century. The Paris Skull. Once again, we meet up with our old friend Eugene Bourbon, the original owner of the Paris Skull, the smallest of the museum skulls. The skull currently is housed in the Musée de Caille Branly. It measures only 10 centimeters, 4 inches from chin to top. Wow, that's really small. It's a tiny little skull. It's like a shrunken head. Bourbon sold the skull to young Alphonse Pinard, a French art collector and explorer in 1875 who donated it to the museum in 1878. What makes this skull unique is the hole drilled through its center. A smaller skull held in a private collection also has a hole drilled through the center and was used as the base of a crucifix. So there's some speculation that the Paris skull might have had a similar use. After some researchers got their hands on it around 2007 to 2008, they concluded that it couldn't be a pre-Columbian artifact. Based on tool markings found on the skull, it had been made with modern tools. Using a particle accelerator, they discovered traces of water that could be dated to the 1800s, suggesting the skull was carved between 1867 and 1875 when it was sold. Wow, using a particle? Science is crazy. Like, carbon dating is amazing. The fact that that's how we use, how we work things out. This isn't the science channel. Channel, so I won't go into it and honestly I don't exactly remember but I do remember that it's incredibly cool and now particle accelerators using to date water from carving of crystal skulls in the 1800s that's some that science is great why can't we just wonder at science rather than wonder about whether these crystal skulls have some magic healing ability which they don't you know what has magical healing ability? Hospitals. The Barris Skull at one time was claimed to represent some Aztec god of the dead, which I'm not even going to try and pronounce, but oddly doesn't seem to have any occult powers. Apparently representing the god of the dead is odd, is occult enough. Of course, when it became apparent that money could be made, more skulls started appearing in private collections all over the world. Shocking. <laughs> Max, the gift to mankind. Max currently resides in Texas and, as all things Texan, is considered the largest of the ancient crystal skulls. None of th none of these are ancient, though. At 36,000 years, I'm guessing he might be the oldest, too. According to the owner, Joanne Parks, she received the skull from a Tibetan healer, Norbu Chen, around 1973, but other claims suggest that the skull was found in a tomb in Guatemala sometime between 1924 and 1926. My bet, this skull was created in Shenzhen. <laughs> 1984. I don't know. Look, it's not going to be real, is it? 36,000 years old? Oh, please. Conveniently, there are no records for this extraordinary find. Oh, my! That is convenient. Yes, that's a wow. Parks claims that, unaware of the value of the skull, she kept it in a closet from 1980 to 1987, during which time Max communicated with her in her dreams. It was only after seeing a program on TV about UFOs the Mitchell, the, the, and the Mitchell Hedges skull I'm assuming a predecessor to a certain series about aliens that are ancient, that she suddenly realized what she had. I'm guessing a faulty carbon monoxide detector, but that's just me. It's always something. It's always something like people here and there. No, she's just having dreams and she thinks her skull's talking to her in her dreams. She's just a bit cuckoo, in my opinion, allegedly. And like, she's not like seeing shit and hearing ghosts. If that's happening to you, you need to get yourself the check. Make sure you got a carbon monoxide detector because that can make you go funny. The carbon monoxide, that is, not the detector itself. Get the detector, please. It'll save your life, possibly. She had the skull examined by an expert, though I couldn't find a name or nature of their expertise, and the expert determined that Max was indeed an ancient skull. According to Max, he's from the Pleiades star system originally. Oh my, but spent some time in Atlantis. Clearly, he's a traveler at heart. Parks claims that Max is a teacher meant to bring people together and guide them to reach oneness. Whatever that means. Apparently, people spending time with good old Max start to have visions of other planets. They start healing and they become inspired creatively. So that's what my creative career has been missing, a crystal skull. I'll just order one off eBay. It'll be fine. Glad I solved that problem so early in the new year. More skulls appeared with a range of exotic names. Shanari, Etiama, Ani, the Mayan Skull, the Amethyst Skull, Rainbow, and Compassion, to name a few. Apparently, they all enjoy long walks on the beaches of Atlantis, spend time in closets and storerooms from Tibet to America to Africa, and spend their time nowadays healing people and showing people visions. Some claim all 13 of the skulls from Maya mythology have been found, while others state that we've only found eight so far. In that case, it's lucky we only needed eight to avert the apocalypse.